Well, good morning, Victory family. How you guys doing over here in Norcross? Oh, it's so good to be here. Uh, also, I want to just acknowledge my family over there at North Cobb. What's up, North Cobb? I wish I could see your faces, but I can't. I also want to acknowledge all of you who are joining us online. I just bring greetings from uh, North Cobb. God is doing an amazing work over there, uh, a tremendous work. It's a tremendous joy to be able to step into the work of the ministry and do what God is doing over there. So uh, just continue to pray for us. Uh, as we continue to expand in that Cobb area, God is doing something amazing. I also want to shout out our senior pastors who are on sabbatical at this point in time. I'm pretty sure they're having a great time, Pastors Johnson and Pastor Summer. Um, just continue to pray for them as they get the, the well-needed uh, rest that they need as they're going, uh, as they're processing. Um, you know, one of the things that I just love, I love that we're in this series, and uh, we've, been, we've been talking about prayer, so I just want to take a moment just to open us up in prayer uh, for a moment. Father, I just thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for anointing this house to hear, to hear what is said by the Spirit of God today. I pray, Father, as we, as we talk through this and we walk through this, Lord, that the hearers are going to become doers. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone say amen, amen. You know, as we close out this series, I'm reminded of a scripture in 1 Corinthians 16 where Paul says, he said, a, a great and effective door of opportunity has been opened to me, but there are many adversaries. Do you understand that there, there's adversaries when you step into what God has called you to do? Anything, any ounce of movement that you make in the kingdom of God is going to come with some adversity. How many, how many of you right now, right now you're going through adversity university? <laughs> come on, somebody. Pain college. <laughs> Tribulation tech. <laughs> We go through things as we press towards what God has called us to do. There's plenty of challenges that are going to come our way, and this is what Jesus is talking about. This is what he's talking about. He said that if you do these things, he said the storms will rage against you, the floods will come, but you'll be founded on the rock. And so this Sermon of the Mount is, it, on the Mount is, is an important series, and right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, we find the strongest point of what Jesus is talking about, prayer. See, listen, if you don't learn how to pray, you are no match for the adversity that is going to come your way. I hear him at North Cobb saying amen right now. And if you're not, you better wake up because God is shaking and stirring us up that we got to pray. We got to start praying again. Some of us have lost hope in prayer because the last thing we prayed about, it didn't come to pass. But I remember Jesus said, look, the kingdom of heaven is like someone who kept knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking. And sometimes God will answer your prayers and wake up to your prayers just by the sheer fact that you believe enough to continue to knock and knock and knock and pray. Sometimes we pray enough to pray ourselves into belief. So Jesus starts it out. Matthew chapter 6 and 6, he says, but you, when you pray. Now stop right there. When. See, our biggest failure with prayer is that we failed to pray. You know, I told North Cobb, couple of weeks ago when we started this series. I said, there's power in prayer, but there's peril in prayerlessness. And I believe the primary assignment of the enemy is to distract you from prayer. How many of you have been in a moment that you say, you know what, you get, get, get an unction in your spirit and you say, I'm going to pray, and you get down and you begin to pray and you get a text message. That's the devil. <laughs> right when you get in the moment of prayer, you think about something that you need to do later on today. 
Just distraction after distraction after distraction. And Jesus puts this word in here, when, to help us to understand that consistent prayer is essential. Consistent prayer is essential. So he goes on, he says, when you pray, go into your room. Not just consistent prayer, but private prayer. I love my amen corner over here. I, we need some people in the back. I need to. <laughs> and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees you secret, sees you in secret, will reward you openly. See, praying privately is a sign of a real relationship with God. Praying consistently is a sign of real dependency on God. And so what we have to do is get into a place of consistent prayer. And there's a, there's a process. See, oftentimes in prayer, we move, we move from desire to discipline to delight. The first thing is that you have to want to pray. You know, many of the things that happen to us in life, we think the fiery trial is a strange thing. But God, sometimes we pray, God, give me a desire. Give me a hunger. Let me tell you what will make you pray. <laughs> Let me talk to somebody over here. <laughs> you, know, you know, problems will make you pray? Yeah. Come on, somebody. We want to remove the problems, but we don't understand with the problem, there becomes a desire because there comes a knowing that if I don't pray, I might lose my mind. I might lose my sanity. You know, kids? <laughs> Children, cheering will make you pray. You know that beautiful that you you know that beautiful little babe boo that you put a ring on the finger. You know they will make you pray. Come on, somebody. There's plenty of reasons to pray. What we have to do is just realize. Look, when a problem comes, it doesn't come for us to have less of hope. Less hope. Our problems come so it can increase our dependency on God. And if we increase our desire. We increase our desire. What happens when we increase our desire? It becomes a discipline. And then if we increase our discipline, it becomes our delight. Because what happens when you continuously pray is that things change. Things manifest. But... If we don't pray the right way, nothing will happen. Consistency, that's good. Praying in private, God will war you openly, that's good. But if we don't pray the word of God, we have no power. And that's where we're at today. Today, when Jesus is going through this prayer, the Lord's prayer, what he's doing is giving us a framework, and I wanted to give us some backstory for those of you who have just stepped in, and this is your first day here, and you haven't been a part of this series. Go back and listen to the other messages. There have been five messages before this. This message right here is one of those that will change your life if you really gear in. Say amen, North Cobb. Amen. Praise God. So Jesus in Matthew 6 9 and 12, he begins to lay this out about how important this is. He says, in this manner, before, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive, our, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And here's where we're at, Matthew 6 and 13. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, keep that up there. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, Jesus gives some, some clues to what is extremely important as we get to this stage in prayer. 
or you get to this type of prayer. There is something and there is someone that is against the will of God for your life. Do you see that? Something, temptation, someone, the evil one is against the will of God for your life. And here's, what, here, here's the way I describe it. Temptation is the enemy on the inside. James 1 and 14, it says, temptation comes from somebody else's desires. Because <laughs> we always thinking about what somebody... Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. And then we have the evil one, someone, the devil. He's the enemy on the outside. So you have the enemy on the inside, you have the enemy on the outside, and this is why 1 Peter 5, it says, it says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy. Now, he's not, he's not a great enemy because he's great. He's a great enemy because he's the primary enemy. He's not great, he's primary. Your great enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion, lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Now, I want us to understand this that we have to have a foundation in the word in order for us to stand firm in our faith. We have to know what our faith is built upon. We have to have a word foundation in our life in order for, to have God's will fulfilled in our life. And we have to press into that. So when Jesus is setting this up and he's saying this, he's speaking to us and he's saying, look, we have to understand what we're up against. We're up against temptation on the inside, and we're up against an enemy on the outside. Now, many interpretations says deliver us from evil, but an accurate interpretation goes into this place that it says deliver us from the adversary. Most interpretations say the evil one, and we understand that Jesus constantly revealed that we were not just wrestling against something that we could see, but we also wrestled against something we could not see. So, how, how to consistently defeat the devil? How many of you want to know that? How many of you have had some times in your life that you understood that you were up against spiritual forces? So, how to consistently defeat the devil? The first thing we have to understand, we have to understand that this is a spiritual war. This is a spiritual war. That's why 1 Peter 5 said, stay alert. You know, I have a friend. He, he wrote a book. He said this. He said this. Our enemy is spiritual. Therefore, our warfare is spiritual. Even though they are invisible, they're also unavoidable and real. So we're up against spiritual forces. I remember that I came into the reality that there were real spiritual forces. It was right before I gave my life to Christ. You know, I was, I was caught up and in, in entangled in all type of things. How many of you have been there? Good. Um, the rest of you, we need to pray for you. <laughs> You've been caught up in something. But I, I began to feel this urge, something different, something more, and I, I began to try to search and seek, and as I began to go and try to search and seek, I began to realize I started feeling opposition. So one night I'm driving home, and this was 1995, man, a long time ago. I'm driving home, and I began to hear spirits speaking to me. I begin to hear rhythmic, rhythmic gibberish, just speaking to my speaking to my head. And it was it was voices, and it scared me so much. As I'm driving home on a dark road, I'm like I'm I'm looking around the car and I'm hearing these voices, and I realized at that moment that we were not alone. I didn't know if it was aliens, but I soon to realize that there were these things called in disembodied spirits demons that were lurking that were a part of the kingdom of darkness. 
And I believe God allowed me to see that and God allowed me to hear that so that I could realize that there is something different that we're fighting against. I don't just decide to walk God's way without any type of adversity coming my way from spiritual forces. And some of us need to wake up to the reality that this is a spiritual war and not a physical war. And sometimes we do so much in the physical, in the, in the physical to try to win the war that we don't do the right things in the spiritual, not understanding that the visible world is moved by the invisible world. And if we don't use invisible spiritual weapons, we will be defeated by the invisible world. Somebody need to catch that right there in this section. We have to be moved and understand that our weapons are spiritual. Because what we're fighting against is spiritual. Ephesians, it tells us, Ephesians 6 and 12, it says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Do you know your real battle is not with your neighbor? It ain't with your HOA. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Somebody fighting with the HOA. You got a lawsuit on you right now because you didn't cut your grass. Come on. <laughs> Some of y'all. I'm for order. I'm for order, but HOAs, y'all be doing too much. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. I don't have one. I know, I know the moment I said, read the scripture, deliver us from the evil one, there was somebody that came to your mind. For some of you, it wasn't Satan. Do you hear what I'm saying? You got a, a co-worker. They're not the evil one. You hear what I'm saying? And we have to realize that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood enemies. Sometimes we give people too much credit for what spiritual forces and the devil has done. You hear what I'm saying? You understand that when Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross, one of his treasured disciples, the one who he called Peter, the rock, began to speak to Jesus and said, Jesus, you don't need to go to the cross. And you know what Jesus said to Peter? He looked at Peter and he said, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, Peter was not Satan. He was just listening to him. Come on, somebody. <laughs> hey, listen, I don't want to hype you today. I want to help you to get a discernment about your spirit so that as you're maneuvering through life and trying to do what God called you to do, sometimes we need to take a step back, understand who we're dealing with, that you're not dealing with flesh and blood and scenarios. Sometimes you need to stop in that moment while you're getting ready to say something. Go find you a closet. Go find you a phone booth like Clark Kent. I don't know what you need to do. Find a place to get away and pray about the situation because you may not be dealing with what you're dealing with. You may be dealing with something that is bigger and that is something that is invisible that you need to cast down, that you need to do spiritual warfare against. You don't need to be talking to people sometimes. Sometimes you need to be talking to the Lord of Heaven's armies about people, about the spirits that are invading the atmosphere, about your children, about your spouse, about your job, about your career. Because the same way God can use us, anyone who gives their ear to spiritual wickedness, the devil can use them. Now, listen, I know we don't often come to church to hear about the devil. <laughs> I'm, but, but you understand, that's a problem too, right? What if you played on a football team and you got ready to play in a championship, and the coach never told you about the other player, uh, other team and the plays that they're running. Do you think you're going to win? No, you're not going to win. 
That's why Jesus made it important for us to understand that you got an enemy on the inside. That I'm not, I don't want you to be led to, the, but you have another enemy that you need to be delivered from. Turn to someone and say, don't let the devil use you. <laughs> hey, hold up, hold up. Some of you looked at your spouse over there at North Cobb, and y'all got a war going on right now. Father, I thank you that the devil will not, will not use anybody in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So we have to understand that this is a spiritual war. That's the first thing we have to understand. Now, the other thing we have to understand, how to consistently defeat the devil, is that we have to understand the devil has no power over us. Yes. Over us. Now, I did not say the devil has no power. He does not have any power over us. Who? The body of Christ. You hear what I'm saying? Those of us who are in Christ, the enemy has no power over us unless we give him power. What happened to me when I was delivered? I was delivered from the power of darkness and brought into the kingdom of his son. I want, you to, I want to read that to you in Colossians 1, 13. I want, I want you to see what it says. It says, he has delivered us. I want you to say that for yourself. Where it says us, say me. He has delivered me from the power of darkness and, con and conveyed me into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom I have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. Verse 16, for by him who... It's him, Jesus. All things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He's the creator. The, look, the devil is not right here and Jesus is right here. He created all things. Visible and invisible. Thrones, dominions, kingdoms, and powers. I want, you, I want you to get this. Colossians 2 and 15. After he created them, after he went to the cross, look what it says. And having disarmed the powers and authorities. Now, pause right there. The reason why he had to disarm the powers and authorities is because in the garden, when the serpent... The devil deceived Eve. We gave the authority to him. So Jesus came back to give us back the authority that we initially had. So it says, and having disarmed the powers and authority, authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So when the cross happened, what happened was the earth shook, and the Bible says he led captivity captive. He took the keys from death, hell, and the grave. Amen. And he gave them to the church. So he, it's been given back to us. The problem is, is that if we don't know it, the enemy can lie about what belongs to us. Come on, somebody. We have to know what, what is given to us. We have to know the authority that is given to us. Ephesians 1, and 23. We're going to learn today. Get some scripture in us today. And he, talking about Jesus, put all things under his feet. Now, let me ask you something. Is your foot a part of your body? Is your foot a part of your body? Who are we? The body of Christ. So all things are under the feet of Jesus. That means all things are under our feet. Yeah. Come on, somebody. I might say, come on, somebody, 25 times before you. Because <laughs> we need to get this. You know, the truth of the matter is I've been walking with Christ a little over 27 years. 
And every now and then I come to a season that I realize I've drifted from, from foundational principles. And the enemy starts moving in. He starts gaining ground. And when I have to get back to what I, where I started, get, get back to how God delivered me in the first place. Understanding the authority that I walk in. Understanding the authority that we walk in. And some of us, we know these things, but we have allowed them to drift. And before today is over, we're not just going to know it. We're going to begin to do it. We're going to begin to act on the authority that God has given us. Amen? Because I don't know about anybody else. I am sick and tired of the enemy gaining ground and gaining lands that does not belong to him. No more. It says he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, from there, we realize that Satan has been defeated. Demonic powers, demonic systems, principalities, authorities, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, they have been defeated. And the only authority that they now have is the authority that we release to them and we give to them. The only power that the enemy have is deception through lies and lust. Once you hear that. If he can get you to act upon your lust, he can, ensnare you, he can ensnare you into temptation. If he can get you to believe a lie, he can get you not to walk in the authority that God has given you. This is why it's important for us to understand what the word of God has said because the main thing the enemy wants to do is to lie to you about who you really are because he is, not, he is not more powerful than you. Think about it this way. What is stronger, a human or a bug? <laughs> just think about it. All right? Let's just say a human or, or scorpion. Now, how many of you are afraid of scorpions? Raise your hands. Let's be honest. All right? You know, because when I said bug, a lot of you said, well, it depends. <laughs> you, you, you're talking about, Pastor, you're talking about like one of those little bitty, little bitty roaches? Or you're talking about the big Florida roaches? <laughs> I was just in Florida and I saw some roaches, that's all. <laughs> I want you to understand this. If he can lie, he can level the playing field. But here's what I want you to know. It doesn't matter how big a scorpion is or a roach is. My shoes and my feet can handle it. You hear what I'm saying? Do you, I, we have to get that. I know some of you are, are going through all these different scenarios. Forget about all the different scenarios now. You're thinking, what if I'm laying in the bed and I don't see it? Oh, no. See? See what, I'm, see what I'm saying? I know North Cobb thinking like that. But if you know what you're facing, and you know what you're up against, and when you come against the gates of hell, and you understand what you have and what they have, it's just a matter of lifting up your feet and stumping on what God has given you to stump on. That's why Jesus said, you shall tread upon serpents and scorpions. That's what he said. Jesus gave us the examples. You should not be afraid of anything because of the authority that I've given you in me. It's not your, it's not your authority. Therefore, it's not based on how great you are. It's based on how much you believe in who God has called you to be. Do you believe that Jesus has called you to be the church? Praise God. 
I feel the enemy trying to reason some of you right now out of what I'm saying. He's saying, but, but what about this? What about this situation? Now, let me, let me make something clear. I want you to focus on this as we're talking today. Focus on the authority that you have over you. All right? See, you don't have authority over someone else's decisions and life, but you do have authority over what you do. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We're talking about what you have. And so the first step of authority is for me in my house and what I have authority over. Because what he'll say is, well, what about this situation? Well, you got a divorce. You didn't have authority over that. You don't have authority over that other person. But you do have authority over you and how you respond and how you show up in the spirit of God. You do have authority on whether or not you're going to leave out of that situation depressed, bitter, hurt, angry. You have authority. You have authority over whether or not you're going to forgive like we talked about last week. You have authority on whether or not the joy of the Lord is going to be your strength in the midst of what you're processing through. You have authority over that. And that's what I'm saying. That's what you have to know. That's what Jesus is saying to us in this scenario. But if he can lie to you, he can level the playing field. Because that's who he is. Jesus explained to us in John 8, 44, he gave the devil's MO. He was talking to the religious leaders. And look at what he said. I want you to hear what he said about them. He said, you belong, 844, he said, you belong to your father, the devil. Now, first thing you have to understand, everybody is not a child of God. <laughs> I know we like to say, well, we're all God's children, not according to Jesus. And I think he knows a little bit better than us. Amen. <laughs> you belong to your father the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. <laughs> you mean lying is a language? <laughs> for he is a liar, and the father of lies. If he can lie to you, he will level the playing field. Now, it doesn't matter who he uses to lie to you. If you believe it and you receive a lie, that lie can change the trajectory of your life. Some of us have been battling lies that have been spoken over us ever since we were children. Because lie, because the lie came from a trusted place. And we trusted a lie. That's why we have to know God's word. We have to be renewed by, the, by having our mind transformed. We have to be washed and be regenerated by the word of God. Because it is the only truth that we can stand on. I want to just pray right now. I just feel a burden. I just pray against every lie that has been spoken over us from a trusted resources. Father, we come against that in Jesus' name. We understand the only trusted resource is the Word of God. That Jesus is the only one who can be trusted. In Jesus' name. I want you to receive that. Amen. So he lies. And the place he lies is the same place where the battle happens. Right here. Right between your ears is where the battle is happening between whether you're going to give in or be delivered from the evil one or you're going to stay bound by the evil one. The battleground that we're in is our mind. Because if the enemy can control the narrative... He can get you to believe whatever. You know, I had to, 
When I gave my life to Christ, you know, I was hearing spirits and Jesus set me free, but I realized something. I realized that I would not remain free. I realized that I couldn't walk in true freedom unless I shut down the mouth of everything that was not speaking the word of God into my life. So here's what I, I don't know about what you did, but let me tell you what I had to do. Back then, we had cassette tapes. <laughs> I had to get rid of all of these cassette tapes that was speaking death over me, that was telling me how to live my life contrary to the word of God. And I didn't give, I didn't give them to anybody else because I didn't want anybody else hearing the devil's lies either. Come on. I had to, I had to stop going to certain places so that I could find myself in a place where I could hear truth. Some of you right now, some of the things that you're processing through is because you're giving too much opportunity for the enemy to spread lies into your mind. And he's gaining ground on you. Some people, some people don't have it in them to speak life into you. So every time you're around them, they're speaking death to you. And they're speaking doubt to you. They're speaking defeat to you. They're speaking who you used to be and not who you are. Sometimes you got to separate yourself from any place that's not saying who God has said you are. You have to. You know, I called my friends. I said, hey. Don't call me. I'll call you. <laughs> I love them. Close to them. I went to elementary school with them. But I knew that they could not give me what I needed, and I knew that I was vulnerable to the voice of the enemy because I had spent 21 years listening to him. Some of you need to break free of some relationships that are allowing you to continue to perpetuate lies that have been spoken over you all your life. There's lies that the enemy is telling some of us, telling us we can't do without sex. Yes, you can. You don't have, you don't have to be bound by any type of sexual addiction in any type of form. Some of us, we feel like that we cannot make it on our own. I want you to know you're not on your own. The Lord said he will never leave you or forsake you. He will never leave you or forsake you. That he's with you even until the end of the age. But the only way you're going to know that the enemy is lying is if you understand what God has said. And the only way we're going to know what God has said is by spending time in what God has said. We cannot give place to the devil. Don't give him any opportunity to speak into our lives. No more will he speak into our lives. No more will we give, will we give him ground. We got to know the truth. We have to reject his lies. Because if we don't, re if we don't reject the lie, we'll entertain the lie and we will be enticed into temptation. So we have to know the truth. We have, to, we have to speak the truth. But we have to get that from the word of God. Now, we know that this is a spiritual war. We know we have authority. But the last thing, again, I started this out. If we don't have the word of God, we don't understand how to defeat the enemy. How we consistently defeat the devil. We have to understand the word of God is our weapon. The word of God is our weapon. You know, Hebrews 4 and 12. It says the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. I want you to notice something about what, what's said right there. It's saying it divides asunder soul and spirit, joint and marrow. What it's saying is it divides, the, it divides the invisible world and the visible world. Do you hear it? You see it? And is a discerner 
of thoughts. Where is the battlefield? In the mind. The battlefield is in the thoughts. The only way you're going to distinguish between what is you and what is God or what is the devil and what is God or what is some evil force and what is God or the ideals of, those, of this world who is under the system of antichrist, the only way you're going to know that is through the word of God. It can divide asunder soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. And look at what it says. I want you to get this. And it says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. Now, the only way you're going to recognize if what you're dealing with is the enemy is the word of God. He's a created creature. What the Bible is saying is that there's no creature that is hidden from the word of God because the word is light. If you know the word, and I'm telling you, I've learned this over my life as I've been walking in different situations and walking with Christ, I realize there's been times where I'm walking and I'm having a conversation. And I'm walking, I'm, I'm having this conversation, and I realize in a moment, the enemy is right here. There's been times as there's been times with me as a pastor that I've I've been talking I'm, I'm, and I'm having a conversation and I realize oh this person this person doesn't have the right right spirit and agenda. Sometimes it's through perception is what they say, but then sometimes it's through just the word of God just coming alive in me, a scripture coming alive in me because it's sharp. It's a two-edged sword. It divides thoughts and intents of the heart. And when we yield it the right way, we understand that the word can be used in a powerful way to cut off the head of the enemy, to cut off an assignment and an agenda against your life. But we have to have the word of God in our life. So it's powerful. It's a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of whom to whom we must give account. That means that we are too. Sometimes, in my own, I can't speak about anybody else. I can talk about me because I know me. There's sometimes I got the wrong motive. I got the wrong agenda. And all it takes is for me to get in the scripture and I read it and, I, and, and God to correct me. You know that you're in a world right now that has an anti-Christ agenda. Do you hear that? There's so many, there is so many lies in the world right now. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you understand that there, you know, God is not the author of confusion. And there is confusion in the world right now. We're changing all types of things. Like, when you think about this, and I didn't even want to go into this, but we have to dive into this. When you think about the fact that we're arguing over whether a man is a man and a woman is a woman, <laughs> listen, we're arguing on, o, over what, what defines a, a man, what defines a woman. There is a spirit of confusion that we're dealing with. And here's what I want you to be encouraged by. Listen, I know some of you, even right now, some of you online or some of you that are in this room, you're, 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 you're processing what I'm saying and there's something happening in your heart because you've some way found allegiance and became an ally to something that is of the devil. Now, here's what I'm talking about. I'm not saying people are of the devil. I'm saying the agenda, the lie, and the assignment is against the image of God. I want you to know that. We have to trust what God has said. We have to understand what God has said. If we believe a lie, we'll begin to perpetuate a lie. We have to take the word of God. Do what James 4 and 7 said. It says, submit yourselves to God. That means submit yourself to the word. Resist the devil, and what will he do? He will flee from you. Stand firm. Two words. Submit and resist. Submit, resist, run. That's how it works. 
But what are we submitting to? Not our own power, not our own authority, the authority of something that is quick and powerful, which is the Word of God. And that's what, that's what we have to understand. That's what we have to process through. Now, I want you to know this as we close out today. Three, three primary ways he's going to come at you, even after this message. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. That's what in the garden he tempted Eve. She saw that the fruit was good for food. She saw lust of the eyes, good for food, lust of the flesh, and she saw it would make her like God, pride of life. Same temptation. Jesus, dealing with Jesus in the story of Matthew. And I'll say this to you. If the devil came directly at Jesus, who do you think you are to think that he won't send somebody after you. Come on, somebody. Let's go. I don't want you to go. Listen to what I'm saying. I don't want you to go out devil hunting <laughs> just like you're not going to go out looking under rocks for scorpions. But if one comes up, know what to do with it. Look at what it says, Matthew 4, 3, 11. I'm going to close you out with this story so that we can understand how we need to defeat the devil, and we're going to make some confessions about what we need to do. Now, Matthew chapter 4, starting at verse 3. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, and we're talking about who is the tempter, it was, it was the Satan. If you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's what Jesus said. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, you know, the devil knows what's written too. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Look at what Jesus said to him. It is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Come on, somebody. Again, the devil took him up. You know he don't stop, right? <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> On an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you. If you will fall down and worship me, how, did he, how was he going to give him the kingdom of, kingdoms of the world? Because it was handed over to him by Adam. He became the prince and the power of the air. Look at what Jesus said to him. Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil did what? Left him. He left him, and behold, the angels came and minister to him. Look at, what, look at this. I want you to picture this. Lust of the flesh, turn these stones into bread. Lust of the eyes, give you all the kingdoms of the world. Pride of life, cast yourself off this mountain. You can take care of yourself. I want you to know, he's going to be coming, after, coming at us, but we have to know what is written, and not only do we know what is written, the power of what is written, if it only stays inside of your mouth, has no power. What it has power is when it comes out of the mouth of a believer, someone who is the child of God, someone who is made in the image of God, someone who has been given the authority of God, who God breathed the breath of life into. When you open up your mouth, there is a power that happens in the atmosphere. I want you to understand that by... By the word of God, by the spoken word of God, the heavens and the earth were made. And it is by the same word that proceeds from the mouth of God that comes out of you is how we defeat the enemy. I want you to stand to your feet. Because right now, what we need to do, it's not enough for me to preach we got to begin to proclaim the word of God over our life. So I want us to just take an exercise. I want us to 
exercise the ability to speak the word over our life. And I want us to think about this. That God wants to deliver us. He doesn't want us bound. But many times in our lives, we're bound because we get to a place of hopelessness and we stop speaking the word. I want you to know this, that the Lord is not moved by your emotions and neither are spiritual forces. He's moved by your faith. He's moved by your belief in what he has said. And when we begin to speak his word, things change. When we begin to pray his word, things change. And I believe even right now, as we close out this series, we've said a lot of things. We've talked about, we've talked about understanding who God is, understanding your relationship, our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed, understanding he's holy, understanding that he has a will for your life. Understanding that we have to forgive and we have to repent and we have to receive repentance. Understanding that he has blessing for our life, that he gives us daily bread, but also understanding that we have authority. The authority doesn't belong to us, it belongs to him. For his is the kingdom. For his is the glory. Forever and ever. And what we do is align with what belongs to him. God wants you to win more than you want to win. Come on, somebody. That's, God wants you to win more than, he want, more than you do. Let's look at some scripture. I want you to just repeat this after me. We're going to start with 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. I want you to repeat this after me. And I want you to say it like you believe it. I changed a couple of words so that it could include us. Repeat this after me. No temptation has overtaken me except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let me be tempted beyond what I can bear. But when I am tempted, he will also provide a way out so that I can endure it. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. I do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds Casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. James 1 and 12. Look at this. God bless those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward. Now, I need to pause right there. Because some of you are on the other side of temptation. You're walking through temptation right now. And God has been telling you, I've given you power to endure this, to overcome this, to come out of this addiction. You don't have to come out of this depression. I, you've been bound by it. I've given you a power to it. And he keeps promising what's going to happen for you on the other side of afterward. And the enemy keeps telling you, listen, he's telling you on the other side of afterward is doubt. On the other side of afterward is decay and no life. I'm telling you, listen, God has a promise for you. He has blessing for you. He has life for you. Believe God. Believe what he has said. That when we endure temptation, that when we submit ourselves to God, that we resist the devil, he will flee from us. Afterward, afterward. Look at this. You got to say this like you mean it, like you mean it. 
I will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. I want you to stay right here in this moment. I want you to keep your eyes wide open. There's some of you today that you're going to walk out of the cave of decay, destruction. Stop being bound by this world. Stop being bound by the lies of the enemy. And you're going to walk into your freedom in Jesus Christ. That means that you're going to make a decision today to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus did defeat rulers and authorities and powers, that he went in the grave, and on the third day, the rocks could not hold him back. He got up out of the grave, and he gave power to us. That means that your life after today will never be the same. When you choose to walk in Jesus, you become a part of his body. And there's some of you today here also, you've received Jesus, but you've been bound. God wants to destroy those lies over your life. Here's what I want you to do. I just want you to repeat this prayer after me with some authority. Say, Father, 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 I believe believe that Jesus is is the the one who created all things. things. That Jesus is is. the one one. who came down, down. died on the cross, cross. went in the grave, grave. spoiled principalities, principalities. got up out of the grave grave. with all power power. for me. me. And because of him, him, the the Son of God, I can have salvation in his name that I am delivered by his name. Now, Lord, I repent. I repent of my sin, my doubt. And I ask you, Lord, forgive me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. There's a person in here that you've, it's a young man, you've been, you're saying saying the words, you're still not sure, I'm telling you, man, your life is going to change. Your life is going to change, but your words are nothing if you don't believe it. You got to believe it. We receive it, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Everyone said amen. 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 Amen.